All right, good morning, everybody. We are recording and gonna be reviewing the USAS Intermediate Training. We'll start with the wiki page. At the main page, let me show you where our training materials are, the ITC Intermediate Training. But before I go there, after we're done, you'll still find the recording link under the appropriate date of today. Let me go back. We'll click on this. And you can see the agenda and the PowerPoint that we'll be going over. So we got that there. We got a lot to cover, but some good stuff to know about. Somebody else in. So we're going to start with posting periods. Oh, before I start, feel free to ask any questions because I guarantee that if you're thinking about it, somebody else has thought about it and just isn't asking or they're thinking about it. So don't be shy. All right. So we're going to start off talking about posting periods which I know some people think are scary, but it's really not. Um, the posting period is just a period in time in the fiscal year or a month. You do have to create, I'm gonna to go to the instance. You do have to create a posting period. And you can find it under core posting period. So when you create it, well, first, you can see we have October as the current. So I'm gonna create November, current year, 2022, create. So once you create it, it is automatically opened. Um, and what this means is when you have an open period, you can enter transactions. So you can have, let me move this over a little. You can have several open periods. Here we have July through November. They all say true. You can have them all open, but remember you can edit a transaction or create a transaction as far back as July when that period is open. Um, on these grids, you can use the um, covering abilities to see what these mean. Those are open. That's kind of handy. Um, this green line and up here reflects that it's the current period. So what that means is on your account totals, let's go to an account, for instance, any account. When the period is uh, current, your accounts and your reports are gonna give you the current month to date totals. I know it's going kind of slow, but I was trying to find an account with that amount, but let me show you this. So this month column, the actual expended for the month is for October. So that's what I mean by when the posting period is current, reflected up here or this green bar, that is where your totals are going to be coming from. But being open, you can still post transactions back to July. Um, to make it current, say we want to make November current, you would just click this button. And now the green bar is green or reflected on November. 
as well as up here. I am going to go back to October though for this for this training. You can also delete a posting period as long as there's no transactions within the period. So if you have a purchase order posted in May, you won't be able to delete the posting period. But um, had I not opened or made November current, well, like December, I, and there's nothing in December, I should be able to delete December. So that's not working as planned. All right. So some real life examples of why one would reopen a posting period. And in this demo, like I said, they're all open, but say that July was closed, but I realized I forgot to post July's interest from the bank. And that's why I wasn't balanced, you know, with my bank reconciliation all this time. So I want to go back to July and post that receipt for the interest. So I would have to open July to do that because you're opening up a period to post a transaction. You can change an account or a description on a receipt is another example of reopening a period. Um, creating an invoice in September that you forgot to enter like for something, utilities or something, or opening up the posting period because EMIS errors were discovered and a transaction had the wrong account or something. So you can always make a posting period current. Let me get this out of my way. Okay, you can make a posting period current, but, and you will need to do that for like outstanding reports. And that is because on an outstanding report, I'm gonna pull up the outstanding disbursements. You have a report parameter that is I'm going to go back to my favorite outstanding just a second. So like on the outstanding purchase order you have the current period remaining encumbrance. So this current period parameter, oops, is gonna pull outstanding purchase orders for whatever period is current. And that's for like the outstanding reports, including that new CAN purchase order detail report. If you're going to want to pull outstanding um, as of August, change your current posting period to August and just make it current. And you don't necessarily have to, I know this demo has this open, but this can be closed. August can be closed. So no transactions can be posted, but you can make August current in order to get a report or to make or to view like an, what the account looks like at that time. So I know that can be confusing. Um, let me give you an example. And this is how I, I think, grasped, grasped it. When I started, I started in manual accounting. So you had like a ledger book. Anytime you could um, be in the current period, you could be in December or whatever, and go to the bookshelf and get that ledger for August. But you had to open up that ledger or open up this folder to post any transaction. It's the same kind of thing. Anytime you can have a, you can look into the book and that would be your current look 
But if you need to post a transaction, you would have to open up the book or open up this file folder. So I hope that helps a little bit. Um, oh, this is what I was talking about. This would be your current posting period in July. So your month expended would also be on the accounts and reflected on the month to date expended on the reports. And it's because your green bar is your current period of July, 2020 in this example. Even though you ran the report in October. Here's another example. You ran it October 8th, back a month, but since it was the current period is September, your month to date totals are reflected in the account month column, as well as on the month to date column on the report. All right, I did talk about that. These are reasons why you would open up a posting period. Um, reasons to make it current, it would be to look at the report, like I said. Now, you do have different options with reports. Um, you can make the posting period current, not open, like we discussed, but also on transaction-based reports, such as the requisition summary report or the disbursement detail report, those transaction reports, those have a date uh, filter with a start and stop date. So let me show you that. So you have the date parameter here. So you wouldn't necessarily have to change your um, current posting period because of those parameters. And that's because it's the transaction-based report. Now, another option regarding reports is on account-based reports, like the cash summary, the revenue summary, the appropriation summary. Those um, have a total as of period. So what's nice about this is, let me go to like the budget summary. Is again, you don't have to change your current period because down here, total as of period will be calculated as of, let's see, I'm in August. So I'm gonna go back to July. And again, it will, let me run it. As of period is reflected up here, seven one. The as of period current, period that you're running the report for is July. And the current date I ran it is reflected up there. And then all these amounts are as of July. So you got a, you got a couple ways to think about these posting periods or reports. Um, let me pull up. Where did that report go? Oops. I was thinking I had a thought, but I forgot the thought. So we, we will move on. So this is what I was saying about that parameter, the current period remaining encumbrance. Um, because of that, you gotta keep in mind what's your current period when you're filtering that out. And we did, I did show you kind of live examples of these. So, 
And I think those examples that I showed you were better um, than reading the slide. But do you guys have any questions on posting periods and how they're affected on the accounts or reports? All right, so let's go to projects. Projects are used to track projects, like a building project. They were used in the classic software as well. And you can see that this was on like the account screen, screen two, and it tracked the period to date, beginning balance, receipts, and expenditures. We have the same thing in redesign. Let me go there. It's under core projects. You can only currently have one cash account per um, project. Okay. So these icons you're familiar with. And I'll go over this one, but I'm not sure if I added, yes, I did. Can't remember if I was gonna add this with you guys. I think I was, let's see if it's out there. Okay, so let's create one. We're gonna call it, um, I don't know, the softball building. You have the option to fill this in if you have a beginning balance. I'm gonna pretend that this project is starting with zero beginning balance. It is an optional field. Um, these are necessary, the start and stop dates. And the reason is, the figures, the expended, the period to date expended and the period to date received is gonna be based on these dates. So they must be entered before the user is gonna see um, the numbers populated on this grid. These grayed out ones are calculating figures. These two would come over from classic if there were any. And down here indicates that there's no cash account assigned to this yet. So we're going to save this. Um, actually, I'm going to use this one. And this little icon that we talked about, and as you see, as I hovered, it says assign a cash account. So that's, I'm gonna click on it. And you have a drop down. And you can either start typing. There's my account and I click assign. And as soon as I do, you can see this populated. And okay, so this is a good, this has no stop or start date. So that's why these aren't populated. Going back to my original one that we created together to attach, oops. There we go. And you see, as soon as I attach that, these numbers using the start date of July of last fiscal year through June of this fiscal year, so far to date, expended is this amount. 
Now here, um, these can be used, you can view these here and pull a report as well as pulling more columns if needed, like your legacy. But how can these be used? These actually can be used, these uh, fields, like on the account, can be pulled into reports. So let's go to the budget summary. And I'm going to, oops, I clicked on the wrong thing. So you can see the legacy period of date expended. You also can see the period of date expended. So you can put those next to the fiscal year to date expended. So this column on the report would be this fiscal year, but this column would be the period to date expended. So that can be helpful. And you can do the same thing like with the revenue accounts and reports as well. You can put pull in the period to date received and compare it to the fiscal year to date received. You can also pull in these fields, um, like on the account grids. So you have the expended here. Um, for the expenditure accounts, as well as, we'll just do that. So you can see that I don't have anything this year expended, but period to date I do. So I think I have another example. Like a report here. So you can actually pull it onto the report and have both columns right there, the legacy and then the one from redesign. You can also use it with the revenue side. So I'm not sure how many people use this projects. Here's an example of the grid as well as the report. So you can see on the grid, the project grid, what's been received, period to date matches the revenue period to date column. Not necessarily what was received fiscal year to date, but period to date. I would think this might be helpful for like building um, projects and stuff. And then you can see on the account, there's actually a tracking project to date field too, as well as on the expenditure account. Any questions on that? All right, so we have a relatively new feature called the PO repair. Let me wet my whistle. Um, this could be used for any purchase order that has no payments or disbursements posted against it. So it could be hanging out there in the payables because a payable is not yet dispersed or paid yet. So technically you can change something on using PO repair that would also change it sitting in payables. That's the advantage of it. Um, example would be, well, first let me tell you what you can do with PO repair. You can change the PO date. You can change the vendor on the PO and any related invoices that's in the payables as well. Or you can change the account on a PO charge or any 
you know, invoice sitting in the payables. So an example would be um, like scholastic, scholastic vendor. Use, um, I even have, I do, I have an example. I go to the purchase order grid. Well, first, I am going to go back and change my posting period. Um, back to October. Now, PO repair does um, follow the posting rules for most of them. The vendor repair is not restricted to the posting period rules. So now that I'm in the current period, as October, I am going to pull up a purchase order and PO repair it to change it without reopening the posting period. So you can see that this is September. We're going to pretend September is closed um, and, and change um, the vendor. So I would click on here, review the purchase order. Okay. Um, there's always leaps in training, live training. I was playing with this purchase order yesterday and because I modified it, it's no longer um, available. So let me pick another purchase order. You see that this one has zero paid and it has the option to repair. I click on repair. I have three tabs up here, account, vendor, or date. And again, I don't know if you guys realize this, but sometimes in the software, these things can move. So I just kind of want to move it away to see what the purchase order date was. These are drop downs, so I could change it from this account to a different account and then click update. And it would give you a report. You can change it to a different vendor. Currently, it's Pine Lakes Gymnasium. You have a drop down there. You would choose that. Click update. Again, you would have an, um, a, a result printout. And I'll just change the date here. The 1014, I'm going to change it knowing that September is open. Change it to uh, September. Click update. I get my typical warnings, but here is the print result that I was going that I was mentioning, um, reflecting what you did, and if needed, you could print it out. Um, and this is available for any three of those PO repair options. So that print result will um, give you the result when you apply it. Um, the one thing that you cannot do with PO repair is change a PO that's marked a multi-vendor to, you can't change the vendor on a PO that's marked a multi-vendor. Any questions on that? All right, so I don't know how many people use this, but this is kind of neat. And I saw a ticket comment yesterday about how the AP invoice import or the import process saved the district a lot of time. So I was excited when I saw that because we have a lot of import um, options to import transactions like um, purchase order. You can import purchase orders from a template where, um, let me open up, I'll go to the purchase order grid. 
but I am also going to open up the CSV file. And on that PowerPoint, sorry, when you click on the link, it's just not my day, is it? <laughs> there we go. Um, it takes you to the wiki. You can see that there's a template worksheet that I'm gonna pull up and show you it populated and imported. But I started from here, which is a blank template spreadsheet that's populated or formatted correctly. Now we also have, you know, the columns on the spreadsheet is defined as well as the format options here. So let me go back. Two. So here is the um, PO import file. I have the date of the PO. I'm leaving it blank because I automatically assign the PO number. So by leaving it blank, the system knows it'll automatically assign. You have the vendor number. And again, the criteria in the wiki will tell you what's necessary or required. But this is how I populated it. Some of these I didn't use. Um, the reference number. So this column, this is saying, you can kind of see with the description too. This is PO line, line one, PO line two. Um, anyway. This is a representative of a split PO. And I'm going to take this populated and show you how to import it. You have this button here, import purchasers via CSV. It's really this simple. You choose that file that we were just entering the transactions. Um, there's my file, I hit load, I'll get a result file here, records loaded five. Now, either way, you get this little USAS load error document. And if you had an error, it would tell you something around here, you know, it would show you the error. So it's as easy as that with all of these import options. Um, so here's the one that's the hotel split to two accounts. And it worked perfectly to two different accounts, different amounts, just by uploading a spreadsheet. Now you can do that with, um, Receipts. Including um, using oops, I don't know what I did. There we go. Including using the XREF code. Like say you have the XREF attached to the account code. So this account code for the cafeteria is XREF with breakfast. This one with the function code of 1513 is a la carte. So you take that under the receipt. Do the same thing, import, choose file. I don't think I have one that, um, shows an error. I think I was testing and make sure they didn't have an error. But again, that file down there would reflect what error. Two, two records loaded, they populated with the, the breakfast, or I had one description just to show that it was imported with an XREF. Um, you can do that with um, invoices too. 
So an example of that, I'm not sure what my, let's pull up the file. Invoice import. Um, I'm going to do the status of full. There's the purchase order number, the invoice number. So we'll just import that simple under the APM port. Load. Reloaded. This is an example. Although my three records did have a PO, so I'm not sure why I got that, that error, but that's an example of what it would do and show. I do see that it does populate, like there's my invoices. So, but that's how it works. And you can do this with um, vendors too. And the neat thing about this is, you know how the vendors have the location, multiple locations sometimes. So you could have a PO location, you could have a um, check location. You can have that identified here too. And again, you would get that template to make sure you have the required fields here. You have the primary location, the check location, primary name, name one. So if I took that, it's the same process. So convenient. I'm not sure how often we do importing of vendors, but one never knows. It's there to be convenient. And again, one record loaded. I forgot what, it was Mercy, wasn't it? So let's look at the locations. And it successfully imported. Any questions on those imports? Those are the fun things in the software. Another fun thing I think is custom forms. You can take any PDF transaction form like a purchase order, a refund, a requisition, a receipt and customize it. And an example would be a purchase order with a school logo. So on the system. I'm probably getting ahead of myself. So let's go. No, never mind. I'm going to print this purchase order, PDF form. And now I have the default form and the one that I kind of skipped ahead, but this is my custom PO with the logo. So once I'll show you how I got it to be in the drop down, but if I choose that and I print it, it will be not the default PO, it'll be the one with the logo right up here. But to, to get that there and to get any form or customized form to be available, um, there is a link in the documentation under the appendix, useful procedures, I believe. Yep, creating custom forms for printing PDF transactions. This is basically where you start. So this is like the default purchase order that I took 
downloaded it, and then customized it with that logo. From there, I saved it with the logo. And again, you can see that there's all these forms that's available to do, as well as a technical link to help with this. But please reach out to us if you need any help. So once I saved it with the logo in the system, I would go to the report manager. And remember, you have the import report, but here you create, create form and you start filling in your information. So I have this filled out already. So let's look at this. So I called the form PO with logo, which is that's what you saw when I chose the, de the non-default PDF PO form. The entity type is like, well, in this case, we're working with purchase order. So it's purchase order. And then you would select the form and upload it. So this is the form that I uploaded. The tag I like using because once you save this, you see it on the screen or the grid. And there's my forms. I have a custom check, I have a PO with logo, and I have a refund with PO location. And I we I took these, the refund like the default and just customize this. So let's go to the refund. I'll show you what that possibly looked like. Once you drop down to PDF and it's loaded into the custom form report manager, you can see that it's available. Let's do the default form just for comparison too. This is the default form. The district wanted the address. So we added the address, it's the same refund. So just with a couple tweaks, any of these can be um, customized, including, um, I do have AR, including an AR billing. So I believe I have this loaded. I do. So this district wanted the billing to show, show you the first one. The normal one does not have the invoice on it or the account number. And they wanted both. Um, I think this district said that they wanted the invoice because somebody didn't pay it because it didn't say invoice. So we customized it and we now have it. And it looks like this for any of theirs. So they have the account number here, invoice up here. So please let us, please reach out to us if you can't get that to work. Sometimes those can be tricky even for me. Um, it's just all in the matter of formatting, but it's a nice feature. Any questions on those? Okay, so under the transaction menu, um, there's an activity ledger query. I suppose eventually we're gonna not compare the software with classic, but until a classic goes away, this was kind of like wink. I know that sounds weird to those who were not familiar with classic software but it was a place where you could pull um, and filter all kinds of data, the PO, the invoice, the disbursement, all on one grid. And you can do that here. You can see here, PO number, invoice number, check PO. So all the information can be here. And you can, you can not only 
make a report. We're going to go over this button that's even further advanced filtering. But you can also pull in your favorite columns on the grid. And I am going to take away my unfavorite ones and show you the ones that I normally do. I don't know, like if I'm trying to look at a purchase order encumbrance or the So you can see that I, uh, it's not a good example, but you can, there's a lot of tips in the documentation, like how you can filter, you can use a, a equal sign and then enter the um, PO number or vendor. I know I have a vendor 79. Here's all the, I can put PO and get all the purchase orders for that vendor. I could pull up that vendor's one particular PO and see all the information. I see there's nothing. Um, so this PO had just canceled full invoices. I mean, this grid can give you so much information, including getting a report. Um, reading my notes, you can, I always forget about this feature too. You can click on the row and get like an open detail view of that line, um, a quick view of the record. So any of those. You can also, I think you saw me do this earlier, um, using a greater or less than. I did less than zero and it came, it pulled up all your negatives. Now, sometimes this grid can have so many columns that you'll get that excessive error. That's when you really do want to use this advanced query button. Um, this helps with further um, narrowing down things. I am going to pull in a couple more things though in relation to a receipt. Okay. So I'm going to show you how you can um, use this advanced query. This probably looks familiar. It's like the um, the reports. So if I am gonna, my example is to find all donations from a certain date. I know I've had some, I just don't remember who they were from. So I'm gonna advance query by using this and pulling it over here. So the type of transaction would be equal to a, a receipt or, or REC. Another thing I'm gonna pull in is the date because I only want anything from July 1st on, from last year. I'm gonna do 21. And I only, my, I only want the donations from one fund, the general fund. So fund equals 01. And then the description contains donation. Now, when I hit apply, the results should populate down here. If I had some. And you can also save your saved query. Now I do have this set up under 
receipts. So here's my receipt grid, advanced query. I already saved, I named it here, saved the query. So now I can come back and use that query anytime. And I, I named it donations. Now this is a little different because I am, I, from what I just showed you, I don't have type on here because we are under the receipt grid, whereas before we were under the activity grid. And so I had to define the type of transaction I was looking for. Here, we know we're looking for a receipt. So I'm gonna hit apply. And there's my donation for Walt Disney costumes, donation for nurses services, and donation for whatever. And these must have some donation references too. And you can see it goes all the way um, back to January 2001, greater than January 1st, 2001. You can clear that query and hide it, pull it back up. You have multiple ones saved. Again, once you pull it up, it pops up and you apply it and it's there. So that's kind of nice. Um, another handy one is that I would think I would use in the district is um, right now requisitions are, or requisitions can have attachments. But they don't flow through to the PO currently. So I would need a list of requisitions that have like attachments, like the quote or the purpose and budget statement so that I could print it out and attach it to the PO. So how would I do that? I would come to the requisition, set up my advanced query that I can use every time. So let's take a look. I have my loaded saved query set up already, recs with attachments. And all I did is find this attachment here over the file name, not null means um, the file name is not empty. So if, let me show you the requisition. If you had, there's one, this requisition has a quote attached. So down here, and that's where it's pulling the file name. So if this file name is not empty, and it's not, it should pull into that advanced query. Not when I just pull it up, but I have to hit apply. I like the rule grid, you always have to hit apply and poof. Um, there's my uh, five requisitions with attachments. One has a quote, one is probably an audit thing. So that's another example where you can use that advanced query more than once by saving it and then pulling it up. And I also found out um, you can say you have, we're gonna do, we're gonna do one with two S's. So when I go down, gosh, I don't like that. So now you can also delete them. So, which I find is helpful because we all make typos. So we're wanting to be named it different afterwards. So now you can delete them. Any questions on that or examples that you want to see? Um, I think I had some more examples on the PowerPoint. Oh, I didn't show you that. On any grid, like, you know, these little arrows, you can go up or down, ascending or descending. But you can also sort, so we want this ascend uh, from lower number to bigger number. But you, if you click shift, and hit the top of this column, it sorts um, 
again on the second. You see that little two? If I hit shift and put it on this column, it'll show a three. So it's going to sort by one, two, and three. So I don't know if you guys knew that. But, um, and it's yeah. Lisa. Can I ask just a real quick question? Absolutely. The filter value, the lower case T, what does that stand for there for not null? I always get confused on that not null, what to put in those param. Oh, true. Okay, gotcha. Thanks. So I could, I believe, do this too. File name. Yeah. Well, we'll clear it and try it again. It's just a shortcut for true though. So T or true, and this means not empty. Null means empty. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Um, I think in the PowerPoint, it gave you an example of looking for um, I went over this. I think it was a student account, student activity account. Found it, find a donation. Oh, a treasurer wants to find all purchase orders with a supply account. So you could take this grid, hopefully you can see that, um, and put the date between whatever you want with a comma, object, anything in the supply, which is the 500s, in the type of transaction would be equal PO. And you would find all those over here. You'd pull them over here, set your parameters, hit apply, and then your purchase orders would come up there. Um, this is the student account budget summary. So say the, the student activity budget advisor or student activity advisor says I have my report shows there's $1,500 encumbered, but I swear I have no POs out there. Well, you can pull this report and um, by setting up this advanced query on the, um, on the grid for the account, like fund equals 200, which is the student activity, the special cost center of whatever is applicable. If it's invoiceable equals true, because it's still out there, or T, T or true, and the remaining encumbrance is greater than zero. So once I hit apply, the result shows that it's these two purchase orders that make up that amount that they said that they don't have, or they couldn't figure out what POs were encumbered still. So then the treasurer's office could tell that advisor um, what purchase orders or remaining. So it can be used in many, many ways. Um, kind of like the grids. It's just a it's a it's a further advanced filtering on the grids, which is nice. All right, any questions? I'm a little early, but I believe that's okay. I think we'll just, should we just take a break early? You think, Amanda? Yeah, I think we should just go ahead and take a break now and then we'll pick up in 15 minutes, so at 10, 15. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, it's paused. All right, welcome back. Okay, so we're on to the second half of the USAS um, intermediate training. And what I'm going to cover in this half, so these first two topics that we're going to jump into, I have the account structure and reports, and then account filters and reports. So accounts, account filters, like these are definitely things that we talk about um, on some other trainings. You know, we touch on these in the beginner trainings, but I'm kind of looking at these from a very specific lens of um, some ways that uh, specifically with the accounts and the different level accounts um, are going to maybe impact reports or grids. Um, then we'll jump into the pending transactions, which for that, um, 
pending transactions are transactions that come over from the USPS side. And so this intermediate training gives us a chance to kind of go a little bit further and look at, you know, where that information is coming from um, and how those get posted. And then once we get to modules and monitor, uh, that's really, you know, something that we touch very lightly on, um, especially the modules in the beginner training. So um, for those, we'll kind of, those that'll be a little bit more procedural where, where we'll look through the different um, options and kind of talk about each one. So that's what we're in for. I'm not sure. We might still go to 12. I do have a lot of um, content. I know we are running a little bit early here, though, so um, if we can wrap it up early, we certainly will. <laughs> okay, um, and as always, like Pat said, if you have questions, feel free to chime in. Um, feel free to drop questions in the chat. I do have that up. I'm trying to make sure I keep an eye on that as well. So um, yeah, um, let's get going. Okay, so let's see. Get logged in here. Um, so I'm at slide 41 is where we're gonna start for this section. And really what I want to talk about first is account structure and reporting. So um, for um, the account structure, what I'm talking about is the different levels of accounts. You have, you know, your funds, which is the highest level. You have your cash account, which is like a fund special cost center, um, appropriation and expenditure on one side where expenses are processed through. And then you have the revenue on the other side um, for receiving funds. So um, this becomes especially important when you're creating reports that can be used as CSV or Excel data um, because those control breaks or like a summary report is something that is very specific to formatting of a report, which data formats do not have. So um, basically, and we'll jump in and actually look at examples here, but where this becomes important is, um, it, so say you're trying to get some sort of total at the cash account level, I want you know the total for every fund special cost center, um, there are definitely ways on the formatted reports where you could use something like a budget summary, um, which is at the expenditure level, and then add subtotals by each cash account. So that's great if you're using a PDF, but if you need to have some of that data in Excel, then what you want to do is pull information directly from a cash level. Um, and so again, we'll kind of look at this, but I'm going to jump a little bit back and forth here between the PowerPoint and the software. Um, so that's kind of where this slide starts. So let's jump in. Let's go to um, our USAS instance, and I'm going to core accounts. Okay, so here's the different grids we're looking at. So we have the fund code. And then, um, so we have the cash will be our fund special cost center. And I wonder, so I never like to throw too many tabs at you guys. I know you already have a lot here. So we'll, we'll roll with it for now. We might want to open two at some point to kind of compare, um, but we'll get there. So, okay, so we have our fund special cost center. And when we're looking at this tab, this is where we have, okay, so cash account, 001, 0000. Now we have, we can see the fund balance. Um, we have our project to date information on here um, that Pat was talking about previously. And there are other, there is other information. There are other fields that relate specifically to this cash account. So, you know, we can see the encumbered amount. Now, the encumbered amount for the cash account is coming from all of the encumbrances associated with all of the expenditure accounts that are that are part of that cash account. So this is kind of like a group total. Um, appropriation, you know, so we'll, we have, I have a little um, chart in our PowerPoint that we'll revisit here, but let's just skip that and go right to expenditure. Expenditure is the most detailed level of the account codes. I mean, at least on the expense side. So um, what we have here is we have all of our account code parameters, your fund, function, object, special cost center, et cetera. Um, and when I'm saying, you know, all of the accounts that are included in the cash account. So that very first cash account that we saw was fund 001 and then special cost center 
um, all zeros. So when I do this filter, which we can already kind of see them at the top of our grid here, now everything that's included in my grid is all part of that very first cash account. So these all kind of like roll up a level. Um, and then if we look at this, so if I, and I probably should have picked an account with um, some figures on it. Actually, you know what? Um, let me go. I just need to change my posting period real quick. Um, you know, Pat was talking about how these posting periods, like your current period is a re is going to be a reflection, um, you know, of, of what's in that period. Well, um, my database actually has mostly information in the previous year. So I want to go, I'm just going to make the current period August of 21, just for the time being, just so that we have some figures that we can look at. So changing that current period, now my account grid is going to show me as of that period, as of that current period. So let's see, we have some more figures here. Okay, so let's look at one of these accounts. So um, now this is the um, the expenditure, the budget level, and um, what I'm seeing is the budget on this account. Here's how much can be spent out of it. Um, here's how much was actually spent out of it. And then my unencumbered balance, my remaining balance. Now, one thing I want to show here is we have this more option. And um, again, like I know Pat was just talking about this with the um, activity ledger. Um, you know, there are other grids related to like the, um, I'm sorry, the account. And Anytime you see on these like more drop downs or um, even on customizing reports, they have these little sections that you can open with this arrow. So, you know, I'm showing it on the expenditure grid, but this is definitely applicable elsewhere in the software is when I see this. And so, again, I'm on the expenditure grid, but if I open this section for cash account and then I go start picking amounts here. So like, let me say fiscal to date expended. Now we just saw that each of these expenditure accounts had the expense, had the fiscal to date expended. That's not what I'm adding. I'm adding the cash account fiscal to date expended. And I'm gonna let this load for a minute because we're adding quite a few totals on here. Um, but what I did is I added the cash account fiscal to date expended to my expenditure grid, which, when I scroll over here, remember all of these accounts at the start are in the same cash account. So the cash account fiscal to date expended is going to be the same for all of them because it's a total of all of those accounts. So you want to be careful with this. I would definitely um, be very conscious of this. Like I can understand if there maybe are like situations where you might need to, you know, see this figure. But especially if you're adding something from like the cash account or even the appropriation account um, level to this expenditure grid, one, it's going to slow it down. It's going to slow it down because like think about how much calculation that is to go calculate like it's the full cash account total on every line. Um, so that's just kind of a lot, especially if you have, you know, maybe multiple columns like that on this grid. Um, and that's something like per user, each user can decide what they want on their grid, but it's just something you got to be careful with. I mean, obviously I added this one on there. It wasn't too bad, but it can, it can um, lead to performance issues on this grid if you're adding multiple of those. Um, and it's, you know, it's not something that I think you'd need to really have on there regularly that you'd need to leave on your grid because again, it's the same figure for every single row. Um, it does cause confusion. We have had tickets where it's like someone adds it and they don't understand why it's the same total for every row. So if, um, you know, if you have a district reach out to you and they're seeing something like this, the first thing I would do is, you know, have them go to that more option and then look at which category they picked the um, field from. So like if I uncheck this, so we'll take the cash account one off of there, close up a cash account. You can see the actual amount. So this is just right from this main section. It's not down a level to connect to that other account. So any of these would be directly from the expenditure account.
Okay, so let me just double check. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do now is hop over to a report example because this same concept is also applicable to reports. So if I go, I'm just gonna go to my report manager. Oh, there we go, let's do budget. And just open up, I'm opening up the report definition for the budget summary. So again, like that more option, you know, have a similar thing here where I have my list of properties, I could select, um, you know, different properties to add on to my report. And um, let's see, so look at I have cash account here. And I could go add this now, the same as with uh, the grid. If I add it to my budget summary, which is coming from the expenditure level, it will be the same repeated um, on, on every line if I add it just as a column. Now, it can be helpful in some cases, and this is why it's linked, because you could maybe like attach it to a header. Um, some reports like the financial detail with July 1 cash balances uses this. So there are reasons to have this ability to add it to the report. You just have to be strategic about it. And um, so that's just um, kind of the overview of you know, what you want to um, watch out for there. Now, let me go back here. So here is our example um, that I just showed, but this is really what I wanna show. So this is really just like the standard account structure, um, but you know I'm very visual. This helped me a lot when I was getting a handle on the accounts and how they work. And so, like we were saying, you know, here's the cash account. Now the cash account is going to include expenses. It's going to take like and those figures on the cash account take into account um, expenses and revenues. So um, amounts that you are spending and amounts that you are receiving. And that's why that fund balance, you know, it's it starts with here's the initial cash. This connects to what they started with in the bank. Here's what they've spent. Here's what they have coming in. And then here is the remaining balance. Now, the other accounts that we see on, underneath that is where it starts to split out so that they can keep track of some detail of why and where they are either spending or receiving those monies. So the appropriation level, this starts to break it down into different groups of uh, functions and objects, but they're not the most specific. I know we don't talk about those ones a whole lot because they're not really like, they're kind of an in-between. They're like uh, just a way to kind of group them to see um, so that you're, it's just like the in-between level. <laughs> um, but cash is the full, is the full um, fund. And then expenditure is like the very specific detail that you are including on the transactions. So appropriation gives you like a secondary grouping where you can kind of see categories. And then revenue over here. So this is where I'm actually getting money into my system, I'm receiving money, maybe I'm getting fees, maybe I'm getting grants. This is the money that's coming in so that, you know, at the end of the day, the cash account can take into account, you know, what I'm spending and what I'm getting so that I can end up um, balancing that to my bank. Um, and I guess, you know, I guess I should have left this big. And I guess so just to kind of bring it back here to, you know, what we're talking about when I talk about like, you know, the levels or like, um, you know, adding reports is so this is why if I have my cash account, like this is why somebody might want a snapshot of the cash total, you know, but if they're looking at an expenditure report, you know, so it's all of if all of these equal the cash, like there are reasons that you might want to get the subtotals of all of these expenditure accounts to see the detail on where that money was spent, but end up equaling your full total. Okay, now we'll minimize. Um, Let me just check. 
Okay, I think I've covered everything in my notes. Do we have any questions about the account structure or um, anything I just talked about there? All right, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and move on to account filters then. And again, account filters are something that we talk about in other trainings. Um, if you were at OEDSA, I just gave like a full, um, you know, hour session on that, which this slide might look familiar from. But what I want to do here today is kind of give this a little bit more context. I'm going to talk about this in a really specific lens. Um, but just the basics on account filters to start us off is account filters can be used to limit users to specific accounts um, for their affiliated building or program. Um, account filters can also be used to filter information on reports, and that is what I'm going to focus on um, for these next couple of slides. Now, this one that I specifically pulled is talking about when you create the account filter, one of the fields on that filter is that you're entering the TI um, or the transaction indicator. And what this does, it indicates which level of accounts the filter row will apply to. And then um, it's only going to, you know, recognize the fields that are relevant to that TI. That's what this chart shows. Um, but what's really interesting about this is, you know, we just talked about the accounts and the account levels. This directly relates to that. And I believe 01 is actually um, appropriation account. Uh, so you could um, use that as well. But uh, again, the appropriation accounts <laughs> kind of get kind of get lost in the mix because they're they're just the the go between. But um, so cash accounts is zero zero, expenditure accounts is zero two, and revenue is zero three. So let's go look at this. Let me get back into my software here, and we're going to go to utilities account filters. Okay. And um, so when I add a row here, here's what I'm talking about, this first field here. Now, um, if we do the zero, zero, so that is the cash account, and then I'm going to do the fund, <clears throat> excuse me. The fund and the special cost center, and then we'll give read only. So with just having looked at those, um, you know, account levels. Now this zero, 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 one will give access to everything that is in this cash account. And you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and we go back to our handy slide here. So it's, so I gave access at this level, which means everything connected here is going to get access from that line. All of the expenditure accounts that have that fund special cost center all of the revenue accounts that have that fund special cost center. If I do this, change my TI to 02, that was the expenditure. So, um, oops, click on the wrong thing here. So that would just be just this last row here. Let me get this. Just this last row here is what I'm granting access to with 02. And if I change it to 03, it's just this group. So it's really interesting when we kind of compare, you know, those, those concepts and um, how this works with uh, the account filter. So let's do this. I'm going to save this up. I'm going to leave it as uh, 02, as 02. And then, you know what, let's clone it. Let's make a 03. because you know we're gonna use this. We've gotta see what it does. Okay, so we have our filters created. And so what we just did is we said, only wanna see the expenditure, like this is only giving access to the expenditure side of the general fund. And then the other one is, I'm only giving access to the revenue side. Did I just name that three instead of two? What am I doing? Um, but okay, let's, for the example, I'm gonna to go to the financial detail report because the financial detail report is one that gives you both um, revenues and expenditures. It has both sides. It has accounts that fall under 
um, both of those those different groupings. So um, I have this ready to run here, and I guess we should probably put the special class in here too. If I just do my filters here, I didn't use like an account filter. I'm just putting in my fun special cost center. This is going to show us everything that matches that. So this is what we're starting with. This is everything that's available for this fun special cost center. So if I look and I'm going to scroll a little bit here, but what I'm really looking at is these two columns. So this column is expended amount. And then this column right here is received. So let's go to where we can see kind of both. Here we go. This is a good page. So see, I have expenditure accounts here, expenditure account. Here's an expended amount. And then here is a revenue account. And here's a received amount. Now, if I go to the bottom of this report, I just um, skip to the last page, I can see received and expended. So let's go do this again. So let's see what it looks like with our filter. And you know, I realized the total uh, might actually be different because I did fund special cost center instead of like cash. I should have done cash account since uh, that could include like any non uh, fund special cost centers that don't start with nine. So if it's a little bit different, that might be why, but it's okay. We'll still get the idea. <laughs> so ASF test, I believe this first one was just the expenditure side. This one, we gave it an O2. So look at this. We have, um, let's scroll down a little bit here. What we're noticing, look at this column is blank. We don't have any of that side anymore because we filtered it out. So let me go down and see no received amount. And that's not because there wasn't a received amount. I, this is still for the same account grouping, but it's not including the revenue accounts. It's not including the received amounts just because of this act, this uh, filter, we, we didn't give it access to that. So here we go, expended amount, boom. Um, the other one, uh, which I made three, uh, this one was our revenue one. And look at this, we only have the received ones. And that was just that, that is the power of that very first field, the transaction indicator. So like, I mean, honestly, this report, this is a financial detail. It's kind of intended to show both sides. There are other reports you can also use. Like there's the account activity with like, where you can actually pick budget or revenue. So I'm not sure that you would actually use a filter like this on this report. It's just a really good visual representation of what you're actually getting with those account code differences. Um, so let me put this in another context is this filter that we used on this one was the O3. This one was revenue and that's why I have received amounts. If I try and use this filter on a budget summary, I will get nothing even though I have, you know, I have um, budget accounts that are in the, o o the uh, general fund, but if I only gave that filter access to the revenue um, accounts, then a budget summary will give me nothing. So really this is just something, you know, just kind of a visual represent representation of what you are choosing with those different filter lines and kind of how it will impact your reports. Um, it's really interesting, actually, because um, I've seen kind of those account filters like, you know, maybe you do just want the expenses on something like a financial detail. It's kind of a clever way that you can filter your reports where, you know, you are, yeah, you're giving it what account you want, but you're also defining, you know, which, which kind of results. So um, I just think that's really helpful. Um, okay, let's go here. And then, yeah, I also just included this one where, um, so the filters, you know, would be used to include specific accounts. They can be used in replace of or in addition to other query parameters. So, you know, we looked at it with this where we just added um, here, but if I also had like within 
uh, this grouping. So let's see. So say I only wanted, let's maybe add this um, receipt code, I believe. Make sure I, I'll make sure I put it in the right spot. And then go ahead and generate. We can use it in combination with parameters that we're entering on the fly. So, you know, it's interesting because I know that the account filters are something that, you know, came over from Classic in a way of, oh, yeah, this is how we restricted users. Um, but seeing these work on the reports, I just think that it gives you a lot of really nice options um, as far as kind of even just some like convenient things to have. So it's like, if I knew that there are certain cases where like, this is, I have this filter, but sometimes I use it in combination with this fund or with this fund or, you know, with, with a different parameter, like being able to use those in combination with each other, you know, I just feel like there's a lot of opportunity here, especially, you know, at the district level, they know what they use often. And, um, you know, I think something, I think these just account filters, I know I've talked about them a lot recently, but <laughs> I think they can be super helpful. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's see. Um, next, we're on to pending transactions. Uh, do we have other questions? I guess we'll just do this. Do we have other questions about either the account filters or the reports before we um, head off to our next topic? All right. Well, we are rolling right along then. Um, I do have my pumpkin spice coffee. I uh, feel like uh, I'm very excited at that time of year. Yeah. A little bit more of that. Okay. So, um, so we're going to move on to our pending transactions now. I'm just going to warn you. Um, in my preparation for this, uh, there's, you know, there's a different aspects of this we want to hit. I've organized my notes into some kind of commonly asked questions. We're going to follow that, but I did notice myself wanting to get ahead of myself a lot. So if I, if I stop and say, we'll talk about that later, I'm going to try not to do that too much to you all, but, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that kind of connects here. And, um, what we're going to look at, I have um, my instances too, and we are going to be hopping back and forth between USAS and USPS, um, but I have a couple different transactions out there so that we can kind of look at, uh, we can kind of isolate what we want to talk about um, in each in each step, in each, you know, kind of question we're going to talk about. So uh, let's go to, let me just hop into the software instead of trying to go through this slide first. And then I'm gonna just go ahead and get us set for USPS. Okay, so where we're going is transaction, pending transactions. And I mentioned this at the start, but really what this grid is, these are transactions that were pushed over from USPS, from the payroll software. This is definitely why this is an intermediate topic because you know it's it's where both applications are connecting and pushing over um, certain funds that need to be posted to the USAS books. Um, but they're from, the, but they're related to the payroll side basically. Um, so what I have here is, um, I obviously have some duplicate ones. This is just so that if we <laughs> go ahead and post something or you know whatnot, we, we have another backup shot at it. Um, we'll take a look at where these come from specifically once we jump into USPS. But the important thing that I want to start with is the type. So um, we have this first type is distribution. This is employer distribution files from the USPS software. And so what this basically is, so employer, this is the employer paid uh, payroll item, basically. So if someone's having, uh, if there's like some part of that that's picked up and paid by the board, by the district, then this is the way that it's pushed over and then paid uh, through the accounting side. The second option here is retirement. And 
Um, so these are the STRS and SERS uh, charges, basically. So this is, again, the employer side, um, like the board side, and this allows a file to be posted to the books. Now, the interesting thing is for um, the distribution and the retirement files, like there are different ways that the districts post these. So these retirement files are similar to the classic board, uh, board RET, I believe. And not everyone uses that. Some of them have their own way to post it to the books. I think some people even did use like um, some version of like the employer distribution, um, but this is an option. So, uh, you know, they may use this. Uh, the employer distribution portion, usually this is Medicare. Um, there are some other uh, like payroll items that they would use it for, but we're gonna use Medicare as our example. Um, the one file that I don't have here, and again, this is one of the things that we'll get to, is a payroll file. So the other type you might see in here is the type would be payroll. And that would be when um, USPS, when they finish their actual payroll, and this is like the charges, what we're paying out to the employees, that whole gross pay gets posted to the USAS books to say, you know, I'm, I'm paying my payroll, that's going to come out of the bank. So I didn't have that file. Again, it's kind of with our, our data being um, kind of back in 2021. I, I tried to create one, but uh, we do have, um, I believe we have some screenshots in the wiki. Uh, so we'll go reference the wiki when we talk about that in more detail, but just know it would look very similar to this, just a different type. Um, there is also an import option where you can um, bring in transaction files, but I'm not really going to um, delve into that today. Um, again, there's more information about that in the wiki. So that's where we're starting. Um, now, the first commonly asked question that I have is um, about selecting the payee vendor. So let's look at one of these to start us off. And um, actually, you know what? Yeah, I told you I'm going to get ahead of myself. So uh, let's just talk about our general setup of this, and then we'll get in that question. So we have three options when we open up the pending transaction. We can post it. Post is going to take this information and make it a purchase order, and then it will appear on the purchase order grid in USAS. Reject is going to delete it from this grid. It will be marked as rejected on the USPS side. That's just saying this one was wrong. You know, look at I have multiple of the same one. I only need one. I don't need two. Boom, I can reject it. Validate is just a validation option. I'll go review the accounts and validate um, before you actually post. I have my date information here. So this is when I created this and pushed it over. I created it yesterday. Um, make sure it was out here um, sitting. So in this case, it might be like, you know, maybe the payroll uh, side would go create it and then they submit to USAS and then, um, you know, it goes and sits here until, you know, maybe there's somebody else that handles the USAS side of posting. I have a description, my amount, and then this payee information, we'll talk about this um, in a bit, but just know for now that this comes from USPS. We have the address, um, and then we have an ID, we have a payee name, payee number, and then these were the dates that this was created for. Okay. So let me see. Okay, so our first question, do they have to select the payee vendor? Isn't the payee already assigned from the payroll item configuration? What this is talking about so when we go to post, we get to choose the transaction date. And then we also have this option right here that says payee vendor. Okay, associate this payee with the selected vendor. If no vendor is associated, the purchase order is created without a vendor. All right, so we see the payee information that comes over from USPS. So why do we have to select a payee vendor? Well, basically, here's the thing. So there is some information that's used in USPS. We'll hop over and look at that. Um, but once you get into USAS, USAS needs you to pick a vendor. You can you have two options to pick it. 
You can pick it right now, right here on the screen we're looking at, or you can create the purchase order with no vendor, but then it's essentially like a multi-vendor, which you can add a vendor to then, you know, before paying it or whatnot. So usually the easy thing to do is just pick it on this screen. Now, what's nice um, is that if there is a payee number defined on the USPS side, um, so right here, look at, we have this payee number that can help us reference what our vendor number might be. So if they organize this between their two softwares, then it can make it very easy to make sure that the intended vendor gets selected on this side. So I'm just typing in that number. Boom. Look at that. I have a vendor. Excellent. Um, so I can go ahead and post this. Um, I'll let it process here for a minute. Um, that is optional. So they don't, again, they don't have to pick a vendor at that step, but if they don't, so here, let's post another one. You know what, let me, um, I'm gonna post one of our um, SCRS here. So if they don't, and then we go ahead and post this, let's go to our purchase orders now. And so I can see, look, here's the first one. It assigned my vendor. All is good there. But this next one that I posted, I did not select a vendor from the drop down, So I don't have a vendor. However, I can edit. This was just created. It's in an open period. And I can go ahead and um, find a vendor. And then go ahead and add it on there. Now, I know sometimes these can be quite large. We've definitely done some um, recent improvements that will uh, speed up sort of the uh, pending transaction posting process. However, you know, if these are very large POs um, as they normally are, you know, sometimes having that extra step where you have to edit to add a vendor is not the most convenient. So um, really, there's no difference. It's just, you know, they have the option to add or not to add. Um, the pick a vendor when they are actually posting. Okay, so um, before I move to the next question, what I want to do now is go take a look. So when we looked at this information, we said, okay, well, that payee number was really convenient to have there so we could find the vendor. So let's go look at where all of this is coming from. Excuse me. Now it's our USPS time. So let's get over here. And where I'm going to go look is, okay, so let's look at a couple places. Um, the payroll item configuration. Let's start there. So Medicare, I can search it by name. If I knew the code, I could definitely put in the code. Um, but so I have the, um, this is the configuration for the payroll item. So this is what the amounts um, are associated with that were pulled um, into that file. And I'm just gonna do edit so you can see this a little bit easier. This, you know, the USPS set up a lot of this part here, you know, this is, um, used within the payroll process. The object codes, uh, I point these out because this is um, related to how the accounts are selected to put on that pending transaction file. So these directly are used in combination with the payroll accounts that their pay is charged to. Uh, once they, so, so they're, they might be paid out of a salary account, but then these objects help connect to the related benefit account. But what we're really concerned with right now is this right here, payee. So um, how it works in the USPS side is they actually create a list of payees. And then once they're onto this screen, they would select from the list. So I wanted to show that, but this is not our final, final page here. Um, so back to core, and I'm going to payee, and we could search it, but look, at it's this first one here. So this is the payee that is selected from that list and attached to the payroll item. What this means is there could be the same payee on multiple payroll items. 
you know, so it's, it's like one vendor that might be used for multiple things. And I say vendor very loosely, just because that's what we kind of connect the idea with in our USAS brain. But these aren't specifically vendors, these are payees. So um, what we see here is we have some information um, and we have this number. This number does not have to be a vendor number. You can see some of these other ones are all over the place or not at all. It's not required. Um, you have the name and then you have the address and some other information here. Now, um, what's important to remember is that we are looking at this through the lens of how this works with the USAS payments. But when you are um, talking about these payroll items on the USPS side, there are two different options. So the payroll items are related to amounts that may be withheld from the employee's pay. And then that would go out to like, you know, the deduction company. So that could be their taxes, their Medicare, their retirement, you know, that's things you, you may be withholding. Um, sorry, I hit my mic. Um, things you may be withholding from the employee's pay. And then most of those actually get paid out from the payroll side. That's the outstanding payables in USPS. So these payees and these payroll item setups are primarily used for that. But we also use this information to get those board, the ones that are board paid. We also kind of, you know, can use this, use some of this information um, to not have to like recreate the wheel there to pull this. And then if that might be relevant to what we want to pay, um, the district's paying out of USAS. So that's really important to remember with this setup is that this isn't all just for the employer distribution. Um, and a lot of, you know, we see all of these other payees that are listed here as well. So um, let's go ahead and just address this one right now is electronic payment. When you're looking at this with your, your USAS goggles on, you're like, okay, so electronic payment, that's my memo check. You know, I see that in, you know, in the US um, AS side, when I go ahead and post uh, disbursement, if it's electronic, then it's not creating the physical check. Well, that is defined on the vendor. When we get to USAS, we're selecting a vendor and it will be determined by that vendor. The payee, this electronic payment on the payee in USPS is only going to be relevant in USPS. So when they are paying out the employee side, you know, that, that this checkbox is going to matter. But for everything that we are talking about with um, USAS side, this checkbox is not going to be working for us. So just keep that in mind, because I know, you know, when you're looking over this, you're like, hey, <laughs> if you're familiar with how the USAS disbursements, um, you know, work, that that looks like what you need. But um, that's why we're selecting a separate vendor, because because it might be different. Um, OK, so let's see. OK, so the next thing I want to point out here. All right. Now that we've learned all about our. Um, USPS information, we see where this is coming in. That's great. You know, we have 500 Main Street here. We have 500 Main Street here. Now let's go, let's go look at the actual vendor. So when I um, go in, you know, when I attach that to the purchase order, then it's going to use my USAS vendor. Actually, I think we're going down here, so I think we can see this. So here's my, my Medicare, here's my vendor. So this is what I have on um, the, the USAS side. And then I have, so my default payment type is check. Uh, so I'm going to get a physical check for this one. Again, if I want it to be electronic, this is where I could modify that. Um, but what I really want to look at here is here's my location. Here's my address information. And what I have on this vendor is 550 Main Street. I don't have a unit number. So this address is different than what I'm seeing in USPS. So what might happen, you know, this kind of depends. Um, this option is kind of, you know, kind of like how the district operates, who updates this stuff, who keeps it 
um, who keeps like the record of it. So if you had, if there was a change to one of these payees, um, is that, you know, is that going to the payroll person? And then they're kind of updating, you know, what they need to send for the employee side. And then, you know, the employer side should probably be sent to that too, but they just kind of update it in USPS because that's what, that's their side of it, you know? Um, so then when it comes over to USAS, if you select this vendor and that's got a different address, like that might not be what you want to happen. So this is our next um, question uh, that I kind of framed this around is, um, what's the box for apply payee name and address to vendor? What does this do? So um, here we go. Let's go to this Medicare one. And I skipped over this last time, but I pick my vendor, look at that, 550 Main Street, and I have this checkbox, apply payee name and address to vendor. Payee name and address is the USPS side payee name and address. Vendor, that's my USAS vendor. So if I check this, let me go ahead and post it. Now, let's go check our vendor out. I can see here, 500 Main Street, number 1000. Now it matches what USPS had updated it to. So if there was a change, now I know that I'm consistent with what the payroll side had entered updates, if any. Um, Again, this really just depends on their process. If this is a checkbox that they want to use, you know, if it is something, because I mean, they might not know when it gets updated or when it doesn't, it won't hurt anything if the address is the same on both sides. You know, if, if it doesn't get changed, then like they could still just check that box and it would be fine. Um, but then in the times where like, in case something does happen, it gets updated, then, um, you know, it would, it would keep them consistent between the systems. Um, on the flip side, if this is maintained strictly through the USAS side and USPS might like go in there and be like, oh, we don't need this for the employee ones or we, you know, we use a different one. Like if they are intended to maybe be different or, you know, they're just being mostly maintained on the USAS vendor, then like maybe you don't want to check that because you don't want your information to be, you know, overwritten um, if, if that's not really what you wanted. So that's what that checkbox does. Okay, let's see. So um, the other question that I had noted here, we already kind of talked about, I told you I was going to do that, is um, that on the USPS side, it says that the payee number is optional. And it is, because there are many cases where they might not need to have this number, um, especially if it's not something that connects over to USAS. Um, however, we did see in our example that that was pretty darn convenient um, when we had the number there that we could use to look up our vendor. So uh, if we had, let's go back to our Medicare. So if we had this one, it just didn't have a payee number here, you know, then we could, you know, look up our vendor. You could, you know, you do still have other options as far as selecting a vendor here. Um, on the um or as an alternative option rather is you could post that without the vendor and then um you could just you know go look it up and then add it on the po stage that's why you have some flexibility there as far as like when you're adding that um so yeah so so you don't have to like the payroll site does not have to enter this number it does not have to be the vendor number but it seems pretty convenient if, if that's something that you can make happen. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's go, I think we're good on the USPS side here. Let's go back to USAS. And I just have, this is where I kind of wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about the different kinds. Uh, we mostly talked about employer distribution. So let's see. Um, so, okay, you know what? Let's do this. Actually, we're not, I, I lied. We're not done with the USPS uh, side. 
So one more thing we should probably just look at is um, in case you aren't as familiar with the USPS side, let's just quickly talk about where these come from. Um, so in USPS, these are modules that need to be turned on, uh, which we'll talk about the USAS modules in a little bit here, but these you know, are optional. So they only are available on this menu if the district chooses that they're using them. Um, but here I have employer distributions, employer retirement, and then here's the payroll submission. So um, this page, I can see here, look at all of these are all the Medicare ones that I had in my grid. I had some rejected ones previously. I can see, okay, pending, that's the one that I still have sitting out there that we just looked at, but I have several that were posted. So uh, look at this, 1021. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, 1021, 1052. So um, this just gives some information back to the USPS side on what happened with those pending transactions. So that is all tracked here. Um, how they would create one of these. Um, so I'm just going to enter a date range, and then there are some other options here, um, but just to grab the basics, we're going to select the payroll item, and then I have a little show submission preview, and this is where they get, if there are any, like, warnings or errors or anything, they get a little pop-up, and of course, this was, I'm just recreating one that, that we already looked at here. Um, preview, payee number, boom, look, it shows right there. And then the total amount, and they can go ahead and submit this to USAS. So now, sent. Now, if I go back to USAS, I guess we'll just do it because we're here. And then let's uh, refresh this grid. Look at now I have a new one here, another Medicare. That's what I just pushed over. So th that's where those are coming from. Um, Employer retirement share, it is a little bit different how this one works. The employer distribution uh, pulls the amounts based on like the, the payroll, um, the figures from the payroll. The employer retirement share, so same with this, they'd have a beginning and an end date. And then they would put in the amounts to distribute. So they get these amounts. They know what they need to distribute for that period of time. And they would just put in, you know, what those amounts are. And then um, show submission preview. And it shows how it's going to distribute to those accounts. Um, there are also reports. So report distri or employer distribution, employer retirement share. So if they um, were like needed to get a report beforehand to review the specific um, accounts, the amounts, the employees associated with those, they can get those detailed reports ahead of creating the submission and submission preview to make sure everything looks good there. Um, now, another thing to note, I have this um, with specifically with the employer retirement share is um these accounts so like it has um again we, we looked at this just with the medicare but this is also the case with SERS and STRS um payroll items is uh remember we were looking at those objects and I said you know the objects that are defined here is what helps it connect to which account it's going to charge it to for this benefit and um so you know for STRS this 210 is configured on that payroll item. And the three options were um, for certified, classified, or other. Now, employees fall into one of those two groups, but um, it's not it's not based on what the employee is defined as. It's based on what the pay account qualifies as. So if there's ever a question, on okay well why does it have this object code so if they're you know if they're a teacher and they should have the certified object code but then you're seeing something different like it's strs usually that's only for you know cert certified staff so um if you're seeing something different in this object um what i would first look at is the pay account that they were charged from the pay account that their full pay was associated with 
um, because that's what's going to determine which of those account, which of those object codes is used. Okay. So let's go to the wiki. Um, I'm going to use SR documentation. Uh, we're going to go to transaction, pending transactions. And we have, um, you know, the grid posting, importing. Um, so more information. So let's go. Uh, let me just, I'm so sorry for the scrolling. I thought I had this in here. I should have probably double checked a little bit better. Oh no, I know where it is. I just, I'm going to try and do this again instead of scrolling. <laughs> Okay, I should have just, I should have just started from the top. <laughs> so here is a better screenshot. So here, let me uh, zoom in a little bit here, move this over. Okay, so here's the screenshot that shows, like I was saying, we had the distributions, that's what we saw before, payroll. So that's what that looks like. Um, and this is when they're posting, again, the full payroll submission. Um, and here we go. So payroll transactions. So when we go in and, you know, we're clicking this um, icon to pull this up to view to either post or not. So, so something like this, and then we click post, um, we get, uh, we get the one screenshot that we were looking at previously where we picked the payee. When you're posting a payroll, it looks different. This is what the pop-up looks like instead. So you have transaction date. That is going to be the date that the disbursement will be posted of. Uh, this is very important if you're posting a payroll for like a prior month, but you're in the new month kind of thing. So like, you know, so say it's October 2nd and I'm posting the payroll from September 30th, like I need to make sure my transaction date is in the month that I want it to be. So if that needs to be a September date, so it's posted in September, this pop-up is very important to double check that. Electronic. So this checkbox is going to decide if that's going to post as electronic or like a memo check, or if you uncheck that, then it'll be a physical check. So if they need it to be a physical check, this is the step that they do it when they're posting the pending transaction. And, you know, I'm being very like strong on this part because, you know, everything that we just saw with those other pending transaction types, we were like, oh yeah, we get a PO. Payroll, when you're posting the payroll pending transaction, you do not. You go directly, you you go, you skip a couple steps, you go directly to posting um, a disbursement, a check. So you want to make sure that at this step, what's selected here is what you want um, as far as date and um, check type, because you're you're skipping a couple steps here, you're going, you know, right to the books. Um, let's see. So the other thing there is um. This is also very important because um, if you have a problem with it, so if this is a problem, if this is a mistake and like the wrong date is chosen or the wrong type is chosen, well, once you're at the check stage, once you're at, you're at the disbursement stage, you would have to void that check to undo it. Well, for payroll transactions, you don't have a PO, you don't have an invoice. If you void that payroll check, then you're going to need to repost it from the USPS side, which can only happen if they're not, you know, too far in the payroll process. If they've already processed the outstanding payables after the fact, you know, if they're farther on after completing the payroll and they can't like unpost and repost that payroll, then they, then you can't generate a new file to just post. So we definitely have some workarounds for this. Like it's not, I mean, obviously there's gotta be a solution. So like, um, it can be recreated, but it's more work. So that's why, you know, this is just um, pretty important. And I know we have some JIRA issues, some feedback requests related to, you know, kind of um, some different ideas to maybe make that not such a scary step, um, not such like a point of no return and, and where you want to be really careful. And if you avoid it, then it takes time. I know we've, we've had, um, tickets about this and, and we have some things out there, but you know, this is how it is right now. So just a big flashing warning sign um, that, you know, I'm giving you to put in your notes is 
if if there's a payroll disbursement and it's like you might need to void it just remember this because um you know again there are ways around it if you need them but you know sometimes it may be better to check to see if there's you know some other solution or like you know what point in the process they're at because um you know that that much might be important to address or plan for if that's needed um the other thing here and i'm not sure um we don't have a i don't have a screenshot with it but i wonder i sh again i'm so sorry i should have checked but let me go to my disbursements i probably have a mm, no my payrolls were imported well so when a payroll is posted in redesign so when you go through and do that payroll submission um it's not associated with a vendor anymore and that is normal so what happens is it pulls through payee information based on the organization information so like the district's information and that is associated with the payroll check so it has you know if you were to print that check it has payee information on there but since that's actually just like a you know posting to the district it doesn't actually have like that vendor line in the grid where it has like primary vendor name is blank and that's that's normal so um that's that was my other note there okay oh boy we're doing pretty good okay i was a little bit worried that i was going a little bit long with that section but um i think we are I, we, I've got everything that I want covered with the pending transactions, but we do have a little grace period here. So does anybody have questions on, on any, um, you know, thing there with the employer distributions or retirement share payroll? Okay. Well, let's go scroll through here, see where we're at with the PowerPoint, because, you know, obviously, like, I prefer going through this stuff in the software we do show. I mean, the PowerPoints are definitely helpful, too, but um, a lot of this I have in here to kind of refer back to if, if you need to um, go review later. So let's see. Um... Yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay. Okay. So then um, next, we're going to go ahead and jump into the modules. Now, it's interesting because this kind of came up when we were looking at USPS. And uh, the modules are sort of optional pieces in the software that they can choose to turn on or not turn on. Um, so, every, so we're going to go through, I'm going to go through kind of this module list that we have available in USAS and talk about what, you, what each one of these does. Um, but definitely like not all districts might have this um, and that's okay. So let me, I'm just gonna log out of USPS here. And then, you know, let's get the wiki pulled up too. So this is gonna be system modules. And we have um, a bunch of information here about um, the different modules uh, required, optional, and then, you know what, let me, instead of scrolling, let me just go here. So available modules. So if you click to go to this section, this is kind of the list that I'm going through here. And then, of course, it's in the PowerPoint as well. Um, in the software, we're going to system modules. And okay, so just to go over kind of the basics of what you're seeing on this page, let me zoom in on this a little bit. Okay. So uh, what we're seeing, so we have the description, this very first column, we have this plus or minus. So if you hover, plus means install it, minus means uninstall it. So that's like our action button. Um, installed tells me if it's already installed in the software. Uh, this one is, is it required? Which some of these down here, you cannot edit these. These are just things that are included in the software that um, you know, you're not gonna be changing. And then um, it has a little ID and a version number, but you don't really have to worry necessarily about those. Um, 
So now, like I said, this is the part where we're going to be a little bit more procedural. I'm just going to kind of go through this list and talk about um, most of them. Some of the like um, file, like storage and transfer and stuff we're going to skip over. Um, But let's talk about the ones that are more so ones um, with their specific functions. So first, ACH processing module. Um, so this one, it turns on the information, the ACH information in core vendor records. Um, and this is interesting because USAS itself does not support the creation of ACH tape files. And that might sound a little bit weird to you because you're like, wait a second. I, I know my districts use ACH. They, they make ACH and they use redesign. Like what, what do you mean? Well, how it works right now is that USAS takes information and puts it on the XML file that they create when they're printing their disbursements, when they're printing checks. Um, but basically um, what you're doing in the USAS side is you're creating a check print file and then um, once it gets to their printing software, if it's able to recognize records as like an ACH instead, then it's creating the tape file in the printing software. So that's not technically happening in USAS. We're just providing information on a check print file that allows that to happen at a later stage. And this was also the case in Classic. So in Classic, we had added some fields so that um, because in order to recognize it as an ACH, there was some additional things they needed, like they needed the routing number, they needed the account number, an email address, and they have, you know, the third party has like specific requirements. And if I see, and I'm, I'm not sure if this is the exact number, but the example is like, if they see these five things included with that check information, the routing number, the account number, the, you know, type, um, the email address, then it makes it an ACH instead of a check at that later stage in the process. So what, what can happen in USAS is they need those five required fields. Again, those were included on the vendor record in Classic. Um, it's optional to add them in um, redesign because uh, basically like not everybody might do this. Um, so if I go to the vendor and let me just pull up this first one here. So what I'm looking at, I have my vendor information, amounts, 1099. I have each see each of these sections, other info, standard custom fields, USPS integration. Um, so let's keep in mind, that's what this looks like right now. Go back to my modules and let's turn this on. Okay. And go right back to the vendor. And now when I look at this, look at, I had other info, standard custom fields. Now look, there's a new section here, ACH info. And uh, let me edit this just so it's a little bit easier to see is, so now I have a spot where I can enter in the account number, deposit night, uh, deposit type, sorry, um, entry class code. And that information, when this vent, if that's filled out, when this vendor gets paid, and a check gets put through the expenditure process and they go to create the XML file to print that check, these fields will also be included on that. Now, this ACH active, so this is something, you know, if they're including information here, they can check this box to make it active. Um, it should be noted though, this field is just specifically a USAS field. Like it's only relevant to redesign. This is helpful for um, looking up ACH vendors on um, reports or if you wanted to filter a grid or something like that, like it's helpful to look this up in our software. We added this as a way to say if it's active or not. Um, that is included on the XML, XML file, but ACH, or I'm sorry, third parties can't recognize it. So um, if there is a way, like if they needed to make this not be ACH, they can remove one of like their requirements, um, but it's not based on that flag uh, right now. So I know we actually do have a request to change that so that we can do some manipulation on our side to like leave out fields if it's unchecked. Um, but right now, how this works is that field is USAS specific. So keep that in mind. Um, 
but yeah, again, definitely a way around it. Um, so, so all of those just kind of get added if that's um, on, if you turn it off, um, if we go back to modules, if we were to turn it off, now those fields won't show on any vendors. Um, next up is the accounts receivable module. And the accounts receivable module, um, basically what this does is it turns this on. So I have accounts receivable, it adds this menu. This menu will not show here if I do not have this module turned on, um, all of this. There are also some configuration options. Oops, go in here. So uh, we have some accounts receivable billing setup, accounts receivable ledger. Uh, those won't, you know, those are added when this module is turned on as well. Um, the classic requisition approval module. So let's go to our PowerPoint for this one. Um, this one is, let me get this big here for us. So we, we, we're going to talk about workflows, right? We're going to talk about the module that gets turned on for workflows um a little bit later this is not that so classic requisition approval module enables approval status and workflow context fields on transaction requisition records here are the screenshots of that what this is used for is there are some third-party softwares that information gets transferred from usas to that approval software uh, to that third-party software and then it also uses a soap service to transfer information back like this approval status um and you know then it has like some workflow context the requisitions can only be converted if they're marked as approved and that sort of thing so basically it talks back and forth this is different than like classic had ram where uh, and i mean actually honestly um redesign is using ram too so um but it works a little bit differently but that's like a one-way street so if you're using a product like like ram um, and even I believe SCView, um, I don't quote me on that, you know, I'm no, I'm no expert on, on the third party softwares, but um, usually the ones that we see are kind of like a one way street. It's like the requisition, well, actually no, SCView does work differently as far as I know. Um, so talking specifically about what I know from RAM is the requisition will get created in USAS and then it gets pushed to RAM for the approval process. And then there's like a report that they get that they would use in the USAS software. So that that's not talking back to USAS like this is. Um, and then, yeah, I probably, SCV is a good different beast because they create the requisitions over there. So, in, and that doesn't um, affect the requisition portion in um, USAS the same way. So not for that. So this is not for that either. This is for, I think there's like a pretty specific uh, third party that this uses. Um, but basically what you need to know about this one is if this is something you need, you'll probably know it. Um, it's not for every, it's not for everyone. Um, but it is available, um, if these fields are needed for something like that. Sorry, I hope that wasn't <laughs> too confusing. I know I went a little circles there. <laughs> um, okay. So let's move on to the EIS integration. So this one is, um, what it does is it adds the configuration. And I think that we'll probably update this at some point where, you know, it says like the EIS classic configuration to the system um, configuration page, but this is also relevant for marking items um, for inventory, for the new inventory application as well. So um, here, let's go look at this. So EIS classic integration, um, that is actually adding, um, so I just went to system configuration, EIS classic integration configuration. So let's look at this. So um, we have a pending threshold, and then we have this automatic checkbox. And um, basically what this does is, um, so automatic will automatically update the pending file for 600 level object codes. Um, if unchecked, these will be prompted for 500 and 600 level object codes. Um, this is talking about the invoice step. So uh, let me go here. And you know what? Uh, it does depend on the object codes. Uh, we don't have those in this file I'm going to look at, but 
we really just want to see what the checkbox is. So let me zoom out a little bit here. Mm, that's going to be too much. We're, we'll, we'll just scroll. Okay. So what I'm talking about here, so we have our different line items, right? And then we would um, invoice for a certain amount. Let's go ahead and fill these. So our amount would be defined. And then each of our items um, has the specific account here. Now, like I said, I'm so sorry. I, maybe I should have had a, a more readily, readily, readily available one with 500s or 600s. Um, but we have the account code and then we have this inventory item checkbox. So if my amount meets the threshold, so my threshold was 5,000. So if my amount meets the $5,000 or more threshold, and the account here has a qualifying account code, then this box is going to be checked when it gets invoiced. Um, they also, as we can see, can manually check this box or uncheck it, you know, so they do have control over this at the, at the invoicing stage specifically um, over checking this. And then what that configuration does is it kind of just determines when it's going to automatically get checked if it's being, if it, if like an item that qualifies is invoiced so that they don't always have to do it manually. Um, the interesting part, this flag, I, and I believe it's come up before is this flag is very specifically only in the view that we're on right now. So, um, this, this EIS flag, I can check it when I'm creating the invoice. As soon as I save this invoice, it doesn't show on the invoice anymore. Um, there is a way to look it up and we have some of that in our documentation. You know, you can, um, pull a report is probably the best way in my opinion. Um, but what this does, what this checkbox does is when this is saved, it creates, uh, basically an, um, an inventory extract item. And so we can pull a report and see all of the items that qualified, to be flagged as an inventory item. And then that is what ends up um, ultimately pulling in on the inventory side. You can do the option to pull from USAS and anything that had a check mark at the time it was invoiced would be pulled in. Um, this is another thing that we do actually have um, an issue for, a, a like a JIRA issue for that um to have a way where like if this gets missed at this step to be able to go back and then like check you know find the ones that need to be checked at a later time so that's something that we're working on but um that's just important to know for right now that this happens at the invoice step and um it will happen you know it is um also controlled in addition to being able to do it manually also controlled by that configuration that comes from the module okay Next one is the email notification services. This one's big. So, you know, um, it's interesting because I think, and actually I don't even have it turned on in my, in my test instance here, but it's because it's a test instance. Um, I think that this one seems like something that most people are probably using. I mean, you know, you definitely don't have to. It's not as like probably for sure as it would be on the payroll side where they're sending out direct deposit notices. But this email notification services allows you to configure the software so that emails can be sent from it. In USAS, that's primarily reports, you know? So if you have a district that wants to use um, like the report bundles and have those be able to email out or even just regular reports, have those be able to email out, um, then this email notification services is what you wanna turn on to make sure that that can happen. So we're going to go to the configuration and then it adds this email configuration here. So let's look at this. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to do my best to explain it, but there is a bit, there are some of these that it's definitely just going to depend on the ITC, um, possibly the district, but I think if you configure it for the ITC, I mean, when I was in an ITC, we had a standard that we, configured for all of the districts, but it kind of depends on like 
the network information. <laughs> so I'm going to do my best to explain this, but I, you know, I'm not, um, I used to have to work with my tech department to get this. I mean, even at SSDT, when we're doing this with test instances, we have one that we get from, um, that we use through management council. And so, you know, this may be something that you may need to phone a friend on, um, but I'm gonna do my best to give you the information I have um, to help you get the right, get to the right place. So uh, first let's talk about these first two, default administrator address and default from address. What I'm gonna highlight is this one right here, default from address. So use this, <laughs> the default from address. So this is, okay. So what we're talking about is, you know, we're setting this up so that reports can um, be sent through email to a user. So I'm going to set up a report bundle. I want that to go to, you know, my building um, secretary or like my department leads, right? Well, the default from address is what address is that coming from? When they receive that email, what does it say? Like, you know, maybe it says USAS, you know, they set up an email, maybe it's the treasurer's email, maybe it's assistant treasurer's email, you know, whatever they, they want it to be, um, that it's gonna be from, that's what they would configure there. I know this is confusing because we have the default administrator address. Uh, right now, these this is not, um, really different or this one isn't like used in a unique way the default from address is what you want to populate that additional field was something that was added as like a hey we may you know be able to use this in the future but the one that's being used for the purposes right now is the default from address you want to make sure you have that populated um we're going to skip this one you don't need to worry about that um and then skip down to the port and the smtp host so this is the part where I'm saying you may need to work with your tech to determine what you need to put in here for the host and the port number. So um, I've seen before, like when I have configured these before, like sometimes it is um, like a specific path, you know, it's it's got um, some words in there <laughs> for um, not being able to describe it better. Or like I've seen them before where it looks like an IP address um, where it's just numbers and dots. So um, what I would suggest if you aren't sure what the host import is that you should use, this would definitely be something um, at the ITC to check with your tech team on um, and they should be able to direct you in the right direction for the host and the port fields. Now, so then I'm kind of hopping around these fields here, but username and password. So whenever I've used this, I haven't specifically had to put in a username and password. Again, I think this depends on how the network is set up um, because what you're defining. So my understanding of this anyways, what you're defining is you're saying, okay, I want to send this email from the software, but when an email gets sent, it has to send from somewhere, it has to go through a network to send that email. Um, and so if there is some sort of username or password configured to be able to utilize that, then this would be the spot where you can put that in. Um, likewise, what I've seen also, um, this is the case with ours for like test, is some networks are defined where it has like specific requirements. So um, like if they have their host configured where like it can only send emails from at from this certain at, so it's like, I can only send emails from at ssdt-ohio.org. If that is a requirement of the host that I'm using, then this from email address might have to ma match that requirement. So, um, so that's just something else to keep in mind. But yeah, so this configuration right here, um, once you get that all situated, that's going to allow the software to be able to send emails. Okay, back to our modules. Uh, and let's go here because I think we're gonna skip a few here. Okay, email configuration. So next we're going to the mass change service. Um, oh, the one that I skipped, well, so I skipped some of these are like um like um LDAP or 
um, some of these file uh, transfer notification services. So I'm skipping those. Um, the legacy password migration, this one that we previously had, we talked about this one last year, but it's no longer relevant, which was it felt kind of good to get that out of the PowerPoint. Um, because there was like in, you know, very specific circumstances, you could uh, migrate where they could like reset their password. But anyways, you don't need to know about that one anymore. <laughs> um, mass change service. So what this one does is it's going to turn on mass change in the software. Um, let's go to, um, and you know what, I'm sorry, I should have said this, but the other, there is, um, some information, um, at least on the LDAP, not on these ones. Um, basically if you think this is something that you need, uh, let us know and we can work with our technical team to get you more information on those. Um, but here's where I want to go is, uh, use SR documentation. And I'm going to our appendix, and I believe this is also in useful procedures. Yes, mass change. So uh, we did a training on this one. Um, I know it's out there in the recordings. I want to see maybe last year um, where we kind of dove into, you know, all the specifics on mass change because it is complex. Like there's definitely, you know, a big warning here. It's a very powerful tool. Um, but basically, you know, what this does is it adds this mass change option to a lot of different grids. And uh, sorry for scrolling here, but so you can see how many different pages that this impacts. Um, there are certain permissions required, but essentially uh, what this does is it lets you to change records or groups of records, uh, change like a certain field on those all at once. So um, an example that we use a lot is like, maybe you want to inactivate a group of vendors. Um, you could basically query that group of vendors on the vendor grid and then if you had this mass change um, option you could say okay the active flag change it from true to false uh, so let's go ahead and turn this on real quick i'll show you um so right here so i have this mass change button this was not here until i just clicked that plus it, it doesn't show at all on any of the pages and then when you go ahead and enable that module, it's going to add it to the page. And I'm in, a, I'm in an admin account, so I can have full access to this uh, button. <laughs> so when I click on this, you know, I get a pop up here and this is where, you know, I could go through and um, create a definition. So it would look something like this to inactivate. There's an execution option. Um, Again, there was a full training on this. I don't want to go too deep into the specifics because it is a process. But um, if if this is something you're interested in this module, definitely check out that wiki page and read through that. Um, you know, uh, go check out the previous training that we did on it. And if, of course, if you have questions, let us know. Um, again, this is a very powerful tool. So um, if you're going to use Mass Change, I honestly would recommend like get a test instance, check it in there, um, because there is no undo button. <laughs> so <laughs> um, powerful, but uh, you got to be careful. Um, okay, so let's go to modules. Uh, what else were you talking about here? Uh, the pre-encumbrance module. Okay, so let's hop to that. Oops, sorry. Uh, Pre-encumbrance module. So what this one is, um, this one specifically applies to figures on the account. So let me go ahead and turn this on um, and let's go over to um, our expenditure accounts. I know we were in there before. And um, it basically, okay, so pre-encumbrance um, is requisition, which requisitions, especially within the USAS software, like are essentially like optional. Um, you know, those, and, and I know I mentioned earlier with like using third parties, like some people don't even create requisitions directly in USAS. Uh, you know, I don't know that they like always need to create requisitions at all, but I mean, it definitely is a good process that most districts have in place in my understanding. Um, but a pre-encumbrance is that requisite, it's before it actually, the PO has been created, um, but you have those transactions that start tracking, you know, do I want to make a PO? Do I want to encumber this amount? And um, so let's go in on this. And uh, if I scroll down here, 
this field right here, requisitioned amount, future year requisitions, these are the fields. These were added by turning on that pre encumbrance module that I just turned on. Um, this is pretty important if you have districts that are doing like a balance checking rule that has um, like balance check for requisition, like that includes the requisition amounts. Um, so at the requisition stage, if they want them to get like warnings or errors, um, when they put if they put in a requisition that like goes over the budget they do also need to have the requisition amounts tracked so this works in combination with some other like modules or um rules so that's important to um to notice and it does impact the remaining balance okay so let me you know what i have two here that i want to kind of talk about together you know what Let's just move these. I'll move this around a little bit. So I have the simple balance checking module, and then the user based balance checking. And let's go look at these on my list. Okay, so user based balance checking, and then this simple balance checking module. So these are similar, um, but what what you want? What I how I think of these rather is. Um, Simple balance checking is like, do I want balance checking throughout my software as like a standard? There's one rule. This applies consistently. User-based balance checking is if I want to be able to have that balance checking be different for each, depending on who is putting in that transaction. Um, from what I've seen, user-based balance checking is much more commonly used. So um, we have this simple balance checking here. Um, again, I have a note that this is used in combination with that pre-encumbrance module if they want it to be for requisition amounts. Um, here's where it's showing kind of what the classic um, comparison option was. And again, like these things, if they had them in classic would kind of come over. So if you're looking at a uh, district's uh, modules and you see this, you know, perhaps it, it was something that was configured um, when they migrated. And then there are also rules that would need to be enabled um in order to um like once this modules turn on in order to like help control what kind of checking they have the user-based balance checking i'm going to show this one i mean obviously if you have questions about the simple balance checking we can discuss that um more as well but i think focusing on this is the way to go um so user-based balance checking if i go to my system and my users and then let's look at my user here. So that specifically adds these balance checking fields, allow negative appropriation, allow negative budget, or warn on negative amounts. So this user, if I wanted them um, so they can't post negative budgets, if they try to post a transaction to an account that does not have the budget available, does not have the expendable, um, amount on that account then instead of getting a warning i would get an error i can't proceed i need to contact some i need to so it's like you know if this is um athletics is trying to put in a purchase order on an account but they've already spent the money that they said they were going to spend they wouldn't be able to post that they'd have to contact the treasurer and say hey can i have more budget or what's going on here um so these uh buttons would impact that now, um, it is important to note that this works in combination with certain rules. And I have that noted on the PowerPoint as well. Um, but if I come in here, look at, I have a little search, user-based balance. This is what I like to search with my little wildcards before and after. And you'll notice I get quite a few results here. Um, let's do this. I want this field bigger. So this description is really important. So, so we have some control like per user, like, oh, can they post, you know, negative budgets? What these rules decide is what kind of transactions though. So do I just want them to be um, like held to this when they're putting in requisitions or is this gonna also apply for purchase orders? Do I just want it to be for budgets or do I want it to be at the appropriation level? Um, 
so there are you know a lot of different options here and we look at this last column for enabled and so those warnings will only apply warnings or errors would only apply um if that rule says true and then it's been activated so if you have a district setting this up this is also important to to take into account with that enabling that module is definitely the start but there are a couple more steps there And then last on our modules is, um, oh yeah, we're gonna talk about the workflows module too. Okay, I lied, not last. Um, USPS integration module, very straightforward, very simple. This right here, USPS integration dropdown, this is added by having that um, set up. And this, you know, having it linked um, is important for having those uh, be able to talk back and forth. So um you know i linked i linked up my test instances using this option so that we can make sure that we could um push over the pending transactions and that could communicate the status back to usps so that's what that module does all right so yes the last one then that i'm going to talk about on this list for now is um the workflows module and i do have that here so um in USAS, this is currently just used for the requisition approval workflows. Um, let's go turn this on now. It should be noted. This is another one. Um, I'm in the appendix here. And um, no, this is not what I want. I want the appendix. Workflow procedures. Setting up requisition approvals. I just want to highlight this first line here. Prior to performing this setup, there is a workflows installation guide for the technical setup. So there are things that need to happen in the background. First, there's like a little instance that gets, I shouldn't say a little, there's like a side, um, there's like, um, it's called Kamunda, which is another um, kind of like instance basically that gets set up that's different. Um, and it, it just controls the workflows in the background. So before you turn on this module, it needs that to link to. So that's what the technical setup helps you do. Um, and then you get to this step in the software. So this step is enabling um, this module, and then that adds our configuration. And that workflow is very helpful for telling you, you know, what to go through here. Uh, we see we've got some new options. Um, I was going to look at the configuration. We've got workflows configuration that gets added by that. And um, you have your options here, which again, that walkthrough in the appendix workflows um, information uh, goes through that. Oh, yeah. Probably shouldn't leave it on though because I don't have that backup. I don't have that <laughs> separate instance. Okay. Well, let me turn it off. And I realized, you know, I thought we had extra time and I've just been uh, chatting away because now I'm uh, cutting it close. <laughs> but we just have kind of one more part to go through and I'll try and keep it brief. Um, but the last thing we're going to talk about is monitor. And monitor is really helpful. This is something that um, really it's going to be, you're going to use this at the ITC level. So I don't really think that um i mean the district roles definitely by default do not have this and i don't know if there's a reason that you would need to give this to a district user but as far as it goes for the itc and for us at ssdt this can be very helpful so um this first tab is events and i have all kinds of different events here i have more detail on these in the powerpoint but I think I'm just going to point out the things that I use the most here because I, you know, want to be respectful of your time as well and not go too far over. <laughs> um, I know we've been here for a long time, so <laughs> our brains can only hold so much anyway. Um, so slow metric events is the first thing that kind of defaults here. And um, we have these timestamps, mo mostly like what I use this for is what we're seeing here is for like report events. And if you ever have a report that might take a long time, um, so these ones actually, like this is my financial detail, this ran pretty quickly. So I just have, you know, the start event. 
but if there's something that I'm running, um, mostly with the template reports and it's taking a longer time and I want to see how long that took, it'll have report start and then report generate. It'll have two events so that you can kind of see here was the start time, here was the end time. That can be helpful to us if you're putting in a ticket um, and saying like, you know, this district said they had a long, said they had a report that took a really long time. If you can find the start and the end event and then actually have the timestamp so we can see exactly how long it took, that would be really helpful. Um, and, you know, like if somebody's telling you it took a long time, I totally understand that they might not have sat there and timed it exactly, you know. So um, this just gives you some information there. Um, I think. So let's see the life cycle event. This is interesting um, just because it shows like the different modules and stuff. Uh, is this the one I wanted? Maybe I want an audible. This is what I meant to. Sorry, <laughs> now I'm rushing. <laughs> but um, this is interesting because it does show you um, important events in the software. So like when a posting period was opened, see, here's what um, happened earlier when uh, Pat was updating those posting periods. Here's all the modules that we just uninstalled or reinstalled along with a date and a timestamp. So this can be very helpful if you're trying to determine timing in when something is happening. The status tab, so this, you know, I come in here, sometimes you can see over here, there's like uh, mostly these ones, activity ledger, encumbrance ledger, um, if those were completed. These basically were probably loaded when they imported. And um, unless there's like a specific process where SSDT is telling you to restart those ledgers, so like reinitialize them. Um, if, if you ever need that and we're ever talking through that with you on a ticket, this status tab, we might tell you to come here. Um, metrics, uh, don't really have too much to say about this one. I honestly don't use this very much. I think this is more for the tech side for SSDT developers. Uh, same with uh, logging. These are different logging levels that can be turned on. Um, but what I really want to use our time here for is, is to look at this app log real quick. So this page is so, so helpful. I come in this page very often when helping you all with tickets. Um, this is a way that we can get some more information on um, certain events or things that have happened if there might be an error that happens. Um, and, you know, a lot of times for you at the ITC, you know, you are getting a report from the district and they're like, hey, I got this error. Maybe they took a screenshot. Maybe they did. Maybe they're telling you what it said. Maybe they just clicked out of it because they were trying to get around it. Like, you don't always exactly know the detail. And so it's tough, you know, because then it's like they're coming to you. Maybe you can't see the full context, but sometimes there is some really helpful information that happens in these errors that can kind of help you narrow down what um, what might need to happen or what's causing it. So um, if you come in here again, monitor app log tab, I like to filter this down to error. And. I see the timestamp. So if, if I was, you know, if there's something, an error that happened, like knowing about what time it happened is very helpful. Um, so we can see, okay, here's an error. And if I click directly on the line, so I'm gonna click directly on the row, then I get this side pop up. And if you scroll down, this right here is very helpful. So I would copy this. You can put it in a Word document. So like if you put it in, like Notepad or Notepad++, uh, even Word, um, WordPad, you know, Microsoft Word, something like that, then um, I don't know if I actually copied this. You put, put it over here. So I know this is a lot of words. This is a lot of symbols. Like this, this looks like gibberish to um, me as well sometimes too. <laughs> but um, there are a couple of things like this very first line usually has some information. Sometimes if you scroll about halfway down, there's another line that might stand out. It might be like not tabbed in. So that can be helpful. Um, as far as like seeing if there is a specific error message that you can help with. If, if this makes no sense to you, that's okay. Um, it does happen to me sometimes, <laughs> most, most of the time. But 
if you can get this and save it in a Word document like this and attach it to your ticket, this is very helpful. A lot of times this is what, um, if we have to go to the developers, this is what they ask us for because they can read this, you know? So um, having this additional detail can really expedite the process. Um, if there is something that we need to work together on through the help desk, uh, so that's a really great place to be able to get that information. So again, I just found the error and then just click right on the row and um, it'll give you that detail. Not all of them have it. Some of them don't, but sometimes there's like multiple at the same time and one of them do. Um, the other thing that's really helpful about this is uh, the app logs. So I don't know if you've seen these, but sometimes we'll ask you to send us the app log. Um, from this page or also the help about has a send, um, but these only go back until the last time the instance was restarted or um, like if a release was applied, then it gets restarted. So sometimes those only go back so far, uh, but this app log, it, it does contain all of the history back. Uh, so that can be really helpful for looking at things that maybe happened a while ago. And I know we're over time, but I just got a couple more and I, I won't make them long. Um, I'm going to skip to admin logs. So I do not have something here, but if you come in here in any of your districts, um, you'll have one line and migrating, you may have come in here and looked at this. So what is housed in this admin logs page is the import is, is a um, like one of the versions of the import log from when they migrated from classic. And, you know, I, now that everyone's migrated, like, you know, you probably passed this part, but if there is ever anything that comes up that might be related, you think it might be related to a migration problem, that is still contained in the software for you. Um, the other reason, probably the main reason that I use this is because the, um, the line that shows here, it shows their migration date. It shows their exact date that they migrated. So if there's ever a question of like, oh, I'm looking at this transaction, like it's from, 2020, I mean, you might have a better idea of when your districts migrated than we do. So maybe I just use that more at SSDT. But if you have a lot of districts, you might not remember exactly, you know, what wave everyone migrated. So I don't know. That's a good tip I have. If you ever need to see their migration date, it is in the software. It's on this page. And the last one I'm going to talk about is security. Uh, so this, um, I know that this one, again, isn't like super straightforward. It's just a log file. Um, if you're looking in here, but this one is new. Uh, we added this to log authentication events. Um, and then I think I have a little slide on this. I'm just going to reference real quick. Um, security. So it displays all the authentication events and um, it can be filtered in a report, but really um, there is some more information in this authentication troubleshooting. This was something that was kind of added for audit purposes. So I just wanted to mention that it's here um, and kind of logging like, um, you know, anytime there's so authentication event is like when the software is logged into. So that does exist now. We've added that. Okay. Just a little bit over. Thank you for sticking with me. I appreciate your time. Um, but that is all I have. Do we have questions about um, any of those different modules or the monitor options? Anything else we want to see? Okay. Great. Well, um, thank you all so much for attending today. I uh, really appreciate your time and um, I hope you have a great rest of your day and have a great weekend.